way out the machine. Cool. Can you hear me? Should I mess with this thing? <laughs> okay. Cool. I'm pretty loud anyway, I feel like. Um, cool. So, um, hi everybody. I'm going to read um, a poem and then some chunks of a play and then maybe one more poem depends on if I'm running out of time or not uh, by then. So, um, I'll start with a poem. This is called Kids. No technology, sorry. False start. Okay. This is called Kids. One, T and J are monkey brothers. Sometimes in class, they make monkey sounds and get detentions. I don't think it's right to stop children at play, but I am just a guest. Two, when A was younger, it was worse. Running in the supermarket, running in the street, in the, school, in the office of the school funding guy, he ran and ran and ran. Three, she tried pills and A became listless drew circles and circles and circles. Even now, her voice breaks when she talks about it. Four, the only time I ever yelled was when C burst in during E's turn. My echoing surprised everyone. Five, I don't understand about 40% of what C tells me, but I recognize the crackle of energy, and I feel called to, can to channel it, though I'm clueless. He is a polarizing presence in the room. Six, it's not going well and I'm flailing. T asks, are you acting? And he's right, I am. Seven, it's obvious, they're hungry, they're unmoored, they're bored, but still, when laughter bubbles between brown cheeks, the trap is laid swift. All right angles, all rows, cuffs creep towards cribs. Just the other day, I heard about D. Eight, I have almost always been the good daughter. All right angles, all rows. I do not have a monkey brother. Okay, um, so this is from the play I'm writing for my thesis. Um, and between titles, but I, I think I'm going to go with, for now at least, um, Miss Betsy Goes to Washington. <laughs> it's a vaudeville about Betsy DeVos. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, a lot of the text is pulled from her confirmation hearing, and then um, I fictionalized part of it. Actually, I'll tell you about that when I when I get there. Um, but so I'm going to read. This is uh, scene 13, and this is the part of the confirmation hearing where Rand Paul was doing questioning. So each senator got five minutes to question her in the hearing. Um, so this is going to be a scene with Rand Paul. Pulitzer. Pulitzer already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will take it. Um, okay, great. I think that's all that you need to know to understand what we're doing. Scene 13. Miss likely to succeed. Projection. Senator Rand Paul, Republican, Kentucky, U.S. Senator since 2011. Paul, to the audience. This whole sort of war on women thing, I'm scratching my head because if there was a war on women, I think they won. In fact, I worry about our young men sometimes because I think the women really are outcompeting the men in our world. Projection. Fun fact. Rand Paul introduced the Life at Conception Act in 2013. The bill would ban abortion and apply the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to unborn fetuses, granting them personhood status. Paul has reintroduced the bill twice, in 2016 and 2017. Senator Paul. He speaks into a microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Miss Likely to Succeed. Beauty pageant music. A huge Miss Likely to Succeed banner is unfurled. <laughs> I have traveled to a lot of schools and have been amazed at some of the schools. Just amazing success stories. And I think we need to think about the kids. Don't you think it's time we think about the kids, everybody? <laughs> Senators of God. Oh my God. Now, Miss Betsy, I understand you have brought with you some very special guests, some special kids, Miss Betsy. That's right. Let's <laughs> meet our contestants. Nydia and Denisha enter. They wear beautiful dresses, they smile like beauty queens. Nydia carries an instrument case, maybe a trumpet or a violin. The senators applaud. 
Contestant number one, Nydia Salazar. It's Nydia? Tell us about young Nydia, Miss Betsy. Under the following, Nydia smiles, waves at the crowd, nods, etc. Miss Betsy. Nydia Salazar is an 18-year-old freshman at Grand Canyon University in Arizona. She was born in Peru. Nydia's mother, Maria, immigrated to the United States with her daughter when she was very little because she knew that Nydia would have much greater opportunity to succeed and thrive here in the U.S. As a single mother, Maria often worked as many as three jobs, but she made a deal with her young daughter. She would work as hard as she needed to, and Nydia would study just as hard. And study hard she did. Nydia received a tax credit scholarship to attend St. Mary's High School in Phoenix, where she had the opportunity to enroll in rigorous, demanding courses. In the future, she hopes to become a lawyer. Nydia starts to open her instrument case. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'd like to... Let's have a round of applause for contestant number one! <laughs> <laughs> applause from the senators. Nydia, confused, closes her instrument case and returns to her spot. Not so fast, folks, not so fast. This wouldn't be a competition without competition, would it? Let's meet contestant number two, Denisha Merriweather. It's Denisha? Miss Betsy, what can you tell us about young Denisha? Under the following, Denisha smiles, moves at the crowd, etc. Miss Betsy. Denisha Merriweather, who I've gotten to know the last few years, is a 26-year-old graduate of the University of West Florida. Like Nydia, she was the recipient of a tax credit scholarship program in her home state. Denisha will tell you very promptly that she had a tr very troubled early childhood in her grade school years. I think she was kicked out multiple times before her godmother finally found a school that was going to work for her. And the transformation was just almost overnight. Denisha is the first in her family to have graduated from high school. She's now graduating college, and in May, she's going to get her master's degree. Denisha. Thank you, Mrs. DeVos. I want to start by saying, let's hear it for contestant number two! <laughs> Applause from the senators. Denisha, also confused, returns to her spot. Paul. This is going to be a close one, folks. Hmm. Beauty pageant music. Paul consults with the chairman, Lamar Alexander. They whisper, look at Nydia. Whisper, look at Denisha. Whisper, then look at Miss Betsy. Paul motions for silence. We are ready to announce a winner. Who will become Miss Likely to Succeed? Drum roll, please. And the winner, this year's Miss likely to succeed is Miss Betsy! <laughs> Beauty pageant music. <laughs> Senator number one hands Paul a crown and a sash. Nydia and Denisha look disappointed, but they clap politely for Miss Betsy. <laughs> Paul crowns Miss Betsy and puts the sash on her. It reads, Madam Secretary. And I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Rand Paul. Uh, I've clearly taken um, not many. Not many. <laughs> You'd be surprised, actually. And uh, say, just to say that, so um, a part of the play is uh, fictionalized. So um, the scenes take place between Miss Betsy, Betsy DeVos, and a fictional character I made up named Tiara. Um, but I just want to say that this is based on a lot of real stuff. Like, she really did mentor students in Grand Rapids. She really did give a student's family a car. Um, she paid for people's tuition, she switched them into private Christian high schools, like, this is based on some real stuff, but then I used my imagination and made up some stuff too. So, um, this is scene 18, and we're going to meet Tiara in just a moment. There we go. Scene 18, Michigan, a change. Projection, 2008. Tiara's final year of middle school. Miss Betsy and Tiara are in an empty classroom, poring over a number of brochures for private high schools. Tiara picks one up. I like this one, Miss Betsy. That's a very good school. They have a soccer team. Yes. And I like what it says about the uh, ratio, the teacher-student ratio. That means how many kids for every teacher. That's important. I agree. Miss Betsy slides Tiara one of the flyers. I think this could be a good choice for you. Tiara looks at the flyer. I like that it's a Christian school. Good. It's kind of far, though. Don't let that stop you. What's a little bus ride compared to the value of a good education? True. Tiara continues to flip through flyers. Tiara. They're closing Coleman. Did you know that? Yes. It's pretty sad. For who? Well, like... 
A lot of the kids in my neighborhood go there, and they're little brothers and sisters. Destiny's sister is there now. She's going to have to change schools. Well, now they can choose a better school, one that's doing a better job serving students, just like you did, Tiara. Yeah, that's true, but it was kind of different for me because you were there to help me, and Coleman was still there. These kids don't really have a choice, you know? Because Coleman is just going to be gone forever. Tiara, I want you to listen to me. I think it's very nice that you care about your old school and that you care about those kids in your neighborhood. But a bad school doesn't help anybody. If Coleman wasn't a good school, why should it get to continue on? I guess. It's just like, I think about all those little kids and they're going to get all scattered everywhere. It's just kind of sad, that's all. And this is the finale. Um, like Lara's reading, this is a song, but I'm not going to sing. <laughs> so this is a, a solo for Miss Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> finale. Who? Me? Projection. One year later. Spotlight on Miss Betsy alone. It's a birthday of sorts. A year in my seat. 365 chances to see all that I oversee. And I, and I so look forward to working, but why, oh why, do they criticize me? Who, me? I've been painted by some public school enemy number one, just because of what I believe and not what I've done. A school bell rings, Miss Betsy jumps, beat. She picks up where she left off. And I'm all for innovation, so why, oh why, do they criticize me? Who, me? You know it's hurtful when they say, I don't care for civil rights. This whole bathroom business is such a petty fight. I love my LGBTQs, so why, oh why, do they <laughs> criticize me? Who, me? Congress is messing around up at that building on the hill. They waste precious time while I foot the bill. But, you know, I can afford it. <laughs> I know the world is changing, so why, oh why, do they criticize me? Who, me? <laughs> well, I'll dance the dance of rhetoric if it's what the country needs. Change choice to personalized and throw in community. I'll fly under the radar so I can get the means to act just like a CEO and make teachers compete. There's no damage, just collateral, as Michigan can see, where independent charters reign and government recedes. I know I signed up for this, but why, oh why, do they criticize me? Who, me? I mean, really, do I look like some kind of mean, unfriendly person? Are you scared of me? <laughs> Boo! <laughs> they deliver me report cards, protest my every speech. They sue me in the name of victims for whom my heart just bleeds. I'm a well-meaning woman, so why, oh why, do they criticize me? Why, oh why, do they protest me? Why, oh why, do they laugh at me? Me? Who? Ooh. Me? Sound effect, hand applause. And then there's a little more, but I'll save that for later. <laughs> That's surreal. <laughs> okay, great. Um, if I have two more minutes? Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to read one more poem. Um, so this is called Come Over Here With Me After Claudia Rankine's Citizen. You are looking at her hand. You are looking at her outstretched hand, but you don't take it. Your palms are almost the same color, but not quite. To take her hand would be to cross a bridge. There are consequences. Yes, there are consequences. You are studying her outstretched hand, but you are not moving, and you are not listening. Your ears are full of consequences. To cross the bridge would be to be a friend, even a sister, even a person who sleeps sound. But you are not moving. You are looking. Your palm stills at your side. Does your palm sweat? You are looking at her outstretched hand as it trembles a little, like reeds, like eyes, like vines. And you are not taking it. You are not looking at the veil, cannot look at the veil, you never look at the veil, the shimmering veil, the bloody veil, because you do not know that it is there. 
And if you do know that it is there, you will not say so, must not say so, there are consequences. You are looking at her hand and she is swallowed and you didn't take her hand. You didn't cross her bridge, your friend, your swallowed friend. Your palms are almost the same color, but not quite. And she doesn't call you any longer, and her fingers still like stones. And you sleep sound like a person failed.